My name is Courtney Colson, a female to male to female detransitioner, and on this channel we try to figure out what the hell is wrong with me. On this episode, rejecting the concept of labels. First of all, this is kind of a season one setup here. I haven't done this angle with the desk in a while. Although I do miss that apartment with the mirror behind me, made it look more expansive, more unique. Um, so my costume for today, continuing my Metal Gear record, my trend here of, of dressing as a Metal Gear character for every single episode. Today I am Dr. Strangelove, who is a lesbian, maybe. I thought she'd be very appropriate for this episode, because looking at this design, it's, it's very butch, it's very gay. You know, she's got the one earring, and she's wearing menswear, and I could tell, just by the way it fit on her, that it was actually a man's waistcoat that she had altered to herself, uh, which I have done the same here. That's why it's not quite as bespoke as it would be otherwise. Um, and she has this infatuation with a character known as The Boss. I actually cosplayed as her in the previous episode, or one before last. And so she was in love with a woman. It's made very clear in, in the tapes in the game, in Peace Walker. But then at the end of Peace Walker, she out of the blue starts flirting with a man, Huey, who they would end up getting married, having a son, Hal, or Otakon, if you're familiar with Metal Gear. So is she gay? Is she straight? Is she bisexual? Or was she just using Huey as a glorified sperm donor because she wanted a child? It's really up to your interpretation. There's no clear answer there. And I would argue maybe labels don't even matter at all. She was just following her desires in that moment. Whatever she wanted, she went for it. Does she actually love both genders equal? I Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. And I've been dealing with that myself, obviously. Well, if you knew here, I was asexual. Before I transitioned, I was as an extreme asexual as you could imagine. It was well, a romantic asexual, as they call it. No romantic attraction, no interest in even affection with another human being. I didn't like hugs, I didn't like being touched, I had no interest whatsoever. No desire in having children, I think, for a lot of non-gender conforming girls, they kind of have to play up this notion of, oh, I hate children, no, never. Because if you even show the slightest interest in children, oh, you're clucky, oh, you want to have a baby, don't do that. That's kind of removing a girl's sense of agency and free will. Just, oh, okay, I'm just destined to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. My other desires and, and ambitions don't matter. So that's where the labels lead to gender stereotyping, leading to putting people in boxes. And it would be nice to imagine we're in a post-gender society, but we're in more of a gendered society than ever. I, I don't see a huge difference between oh, a girl is interested in children, therefore she must want to be a mother, and nothing else. And now it's, oh, a boy likes wearing dresses, time to chop your dick off. There's no difference, it's the same thing. But focusing on the labels specifically, I know it's easy, easy for me to get off track and, and rant about the whole trans movement and Look, there's plenty of other videos where I do that, but focusing on labels. So I've written a whole long ass essay here, it's about three pages long, so I will be reading directly from the screen. I apologize that I'm not talking directly to you, viewer, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So language is a bridge and a barrier, a lingua franca between the people sharing it. It shapes their reality. And as a result, we live in this time that is increasingly obsessed with the identity of the individual at the expense of everything else. We find ourselves not in a collective society, but a narcissistic one that places the individual as the most important thing. And okay, that's good in terms of social mobility, 
choosing your career, changing your career halfway through, that sort of stuff. And I want to make it clear that individualism has numerous definitions philosophically, politically, socially. So I'm not really talking about, say, libertarianism here. I'm talking about individualism from a social or psychological perspective. And in one study I was reading, it describes it as, In general, individualist cultures tend to conceive of people as self-directed and autonomous, and they tend to prioritize independence and uniqueness as cultural values. Collectivist cultures, on the other hand, tend to see people as connected with others and embedded in a broader social context. As such, they tend to emphasize interdependence, family relationships, and social conformity. And human beings are tribal by nature, us versus them, gay versus straight, trans versus cis. But if you look at the bigger picture across time, across different cultures, we have widely ranging views of morality, of normalcy. Uh, if you look at ancient Sparta, or much of Greece actually, homosexual pederasty was compulsory, essentially. It was normal for men and young boys, underage boys by our modern standards, to have sex. Now, by our modern perspective, that is reprehensible. We understand psychologically that is not appropriate, that is harmful to a child. So in that instance, we, we do have some science and facts there to condemn this behavior but amongst that culture it was never thought that way in many cultures you didn't define sexuality so rigidly as heterosexual homosexual bisexual for the longest time there wasn't really language for that it's just you hooked up with whoever you hooked up with and then there were obviously the groups that were led by religion Christianity, Catholicism, what have you, that turned it into a sin, that made it evil. Although, if you actually read the Bible, which I have as a good Catholic schoolgirl, does not once say homosexuality is bad, and in fact, there are instances of homosexuality throughout religion uh, in the Bible, and also just the social relationship, especially between monks. There was this really great, it was a Tumblr post actually, with its, it's citing its sources, but just that you had all these men in these monasteries and they would form very close friendships to our eyes. You know, walking around holding hands, maybe kissing, looks pretty gay, right? Is it? Is it not? It's perspective. There is nothing objective about it. So I think the epiphany I had recently was, so I was asexual and then Towards the end of being on testosterone, I started to have these very strong sexual impulses. It wasn't natural, it wasn't normal. It was just these violent impulses. But it was always about doing those things to women. I never thought of men that way. And then when I detransitioned, then I had a normal puberty, I suppose, a normal sexual awakening. And I was obsessed with girls and cars. If you knew here, yeah. I would be a mechanophile if we're using labels. I do seem to have a, a sexual attraction to machines. But then I had this accident recently. I was in a motor vehicle accident, hit and run. I was run over. Pretty severe head trauma. And things have changed again where I maybe have feelings towards men. I don't know. And it seems to depend where I am in my cycle where if I'm at my cluckiest and wanting to make a baby, and it's like, yes, I must find a male. But uh, then other times, I don't feel that way. It shifts constantly. So, oh, am I bisexual? No, I'm nothing. I'm just a person. And I will do whatever I feel like doing in the particular moment. And whenever the opportunity arises, I am be like water, as Bruce Lee said, you know, take on the the shape of your environment your container don't be so rigid in how you think of yourself and others this epiphany was well we've looked and looked at, you know all the science all the dna all the psychological evaluation studies surveys whatever trying to find what makes people gay 
what is the gay gene? What is the specific thing that determines if someone will grow up gay or not? And yes, we do see children with gender non-conforming behaviors from a very young age. You can look at some little kids and you go, that's definitely going to grow up to be a gay little boy or girl. Um, but then... There are straight people who are gender non-conforming. You see there are female bodybuilders who look so butch, married to men, or very effeminate men. drag queens, married to women, very happy, no issues there. Gender non-conforming means you just don't follow the stereotypes of your society. It changes across culture and across time. So across a wide enough time scale, there is no objective thing that says this is a lesbian, this is a gay man. Um, this costume, is this gay? In other cultures, maybe it is. Actually, you know, nowadays, because women tend to dress increasingly androgynous, uh, or non-binary, as I like to say, where are we drawing the line? It, it used to be the case, uh, it's probably around the early to mid-20th century, there was a uniform, there was a culture, there was a very specific way of behaving and dressing and, and interacting as, as a gay man or a lesbian. That's just tribalism. I think a lot of that is just a subculture because there are people who do not conform to that uniform and that way of behaving. So I realized it's just a preference. All of it. It's just a preference, and it's not to take away from, yes, being gay comes with a lot of issues and challenges, and you deal with discrimination, and it's not to take away from that. The main thing people focus on is whether it's a choice or not, and I think that's entirely irrelevant because, and this is where I suddenly had this moment of going, hang on. Preferences are powerful things. It might be a choice to a degree, but you can't change that. So, uh, I, using this example, I hate football. Not interested in it. Bores me to tears. There is no way that someone could convert me into a football fan. There is no way in my lifetime it is ever going to be a part of me. I am not going to be a football fan. I'm going to be part of the football culture. It's just, is that in my DNA? Is there something in my genes that tells the, the medical community, ah, yes, she was always destined to grow up to be a football hater? No. And it's the same thing with sexual attraction of, I just don't look at men in this erotic context. You know, I, I look at the female form and it's just inherently arousing to me you know there's just all these lovely curves and yeah i, I want to touch i want to get up in that <laughs> whereas men are kind of well you know he's got a very nice personality and he's, he's lovely to be around but it's just i've never gone to that line really i've never gone yeah that's hot <laughs> when i look at a man um but I, I, actually some people in my comment section have said the same thing of but relationships aren't always about that erotic aspect uh you know people debate about this uh, very intensely as well you know is a marriage built on the sex or is it about the friendship and i don't think there's any clear answer there either it really depends on the individuals and the circumstances and the context so again when you try to label things and when you try to put these rigid rules on human behavior or nature in general, you're going to come up against falls over and over again. So, going back into this study on individualism, which seems to be on the rise, much emphasis of the research on the manifestation of rising individualism, showing, for example, increasing narcissism and higher divorce rates, has focused on the United States. Our findings show that this pattern also applies to other countries that are not Western or industrialized. Says so psychology researcher Henry C. Santos of the University of Waterloo. Although there are still cross-national differences in the individual and collectivism spectrum, the data indicates that overall most countries are moving towards greater individualism. So apparently 
capitalism isn't the main thing to blame. I, I think it definitely does play a huge factor, especially social media and all of that. We are encouraged to turn ourselves into a brand. I mean, me here talking to you, I get payment from YouTube. There is this incentive to churn out content, to create an image, to market myself. It's a very bizarre thing to find yourself doing. Individualism seems to be most prevalent in the Western world, and especially after the Second World War. As far as I can tell, with my knowledge of history, and I mean, I've studied a little bit, it does seem, I would point specifically to the teen culture being maybe one of the more significant facets. This would have started around the 1950s. There really wasn't a teenager as a concept prior to then. But you've got the teenagers in the 50s. You've got the car. You've got the clothes. You've got... You got Hollywood as well, you got capitalism. Selling the importance of being cool, of being important, of being individual. But don't get me wrong, the aristocracy has been peacocking for centuries. They've been trying to one up each other with the coolest clothes, the biggest parties, all of that. It's it's nothing new. But that's just one aspect to, to take into account. The other thing. So during the 20th century, we saw a lot of significant progress in human rights movements, be it for the black community, women, gays. And these are all good things, don't get me wrong. But the unintended consequence is that it seems to have created an us versus them mentality. Men versus women, blacks versus white, gays versus straight. Nowhere did this become more apparent than the internet culture of the 2010s onwards. Historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr., discussed identity politics extensively in his 1991 book, The Disuniting of America. Schlesinger, easy to say, rolls off the tongue, a strong supporter of liberal conceptions of human rights, argues that a liberal democracy requires a common basis for culture and society to function, rather than seeing civil society as already fractured along lines of power and powerlessness. Powerlessness, easy to say according to race, ethnicity, sexuality, etc. Schlesinger suggested that basing politics on group marginalization is itself what fractures the civil polity, and that identity politics therefore works against creating real opportunities for ending marginalization. Schlesinger believes that movements for civil rights should aim toward full acceptance and integration of marginalized groups into the mainstream culture, rather than perpetuating that marginalization through affirmations of difference. And this was 1991, the year before I was born. This has only gotten worse, it has not gotten better. Brendan O'Neill has suggested that identity politics causes political schisms along the lines of social identity. Thus, he contrasts the politics of gay liberation and identity politics by saying, Peter Thatchell also had, back in the day, a commitment to the politics of liberation, which encouraged gays to come out and live and engage. Now we have the politics of identity, which invites people to stay in, to look inward, to obsess over the body and the self, to surround themselves with a moral force field to protect their worldview, which has nothing to do with the world, from any questioning. This is 2007, by the way. Again, this is before the whole trans movement. Of, this has been a steady thing that has just continued on and on and on, and um, we would be remiss to have this discussion without mentioning faux cult. There's a big long article here, I'll just pick a few things out of it from Slate. So, uh, there was a book called The History of Sexuality, written by Faux Holt, and it is considered quite important in queer studies, but also it has been misinterpreted by both the left and the right. In The History of Sexuality, Faux Holt writes that Western society's views on sex have undergone a major shift over the past few centuries. It's not that same-sex relationships or desires didn't exist before, they definitely did, What's relatively new, though, is one, the idea that our desires reveal some fundamental truth about who we are, and two, the conviction that we have an obligation to seek out that truth and express it. Within this framework, sex isn't just something you do. Instead, the kind of sex you have, or want to have, becomes a symptom of something else, your sexuality. Though Foucault 
traces the origins of this shift back to the 16th century. Our modern conceptions of sexuality really take root during the Victorian era when the psychiatrist replaced the priest as the confessional authority type. And then decades later we had Kinsey who was very rigid in his categorizations and delineations between sexual orientations and queer studies and sex studies ran with that forever, almost unquestioningly, even though I greatly disagree with pretty much everything Kinsey's ever said, he's basically like Freud. You know, people love to quote the guy, but if you actually study it, there it's, it's insubstantial. There is nothing there. Absolutely nothing. The science of sexuality was born along with the elaborate systems of classification that allowed doctors to establish a divide between normal sexualities and deviant ones. And that's the thing. If you go back into the history of defining homosexuality, what did people use it for? To persecute others who are no different from you, it's just they have a different preference. It's the difference between, I don't know, it would be like if the vegans became the establishment and they forced meatless Mondays on... Oh, wait. They do that too. Again, you delineate people by anything and it becomes tribalists and it becomes religion and it steps way the hell away from reality and science and anything quantifiable. I don't think sexuality is quantifiable. How did one detect, diagnose, and correct deviancy? Parents, teachers, and doctors had to maintain constant vigilance over young children so as to identify abnormal tendencies as early as possible. As they grew up, children would internalize these procedures of examination until eventually they could be counted on to carefully monitor and report on their own thoughts, feelings, and desires. Foucault and people like Hannon agree on this point. In modern Western society, we experience a great deal of pressure to share and interpret our sexual impulses. I mean, I've told the entire internet I have sex with a car, so, you know. <laughs> Who made me do that? Society, obviously. <laughs> Every desire, no matter how fleeting, must be catalogued and made to fit into our overarching sense of who we are. Queer people may experience this pressure in a more intense and immediate way than heterosexuals do, but nobody is immune. You might think you're straight, but you'd better keep a very close eye on things just in case. You could change at any moment. And even if you're and even if you cross your T's and dot your I's and say no homo at the appropriate moments, it's still possible that others will be able to detect something in you that isn't quite right. That you didn't know was there. For Foucault, the obsession with figuring out the truth of our sexualities is a trap. After all, how do we know when to stop? Who tells us when we've peeled away the final layers of social constraints and discovered our truest, most authentic selves? Foucault, who, by the way, identified as gay, knew that knowledge can never really be separated from power. Sometimes knowledge can be empowering, like when we take the language that was once used to diagnose us and turn it into a political rallying cry. But that knowledge can also be wielded against us, often with very concrete and painful results. Thinking and talking endlessly about our sexualities doesn't really get us close to figuring out who we really are. It does, however, generate plenty of evidence that can be used to monitor, control, and discipline us when we deviate from the norm. The entire trans movement. So, getting back to where this all started for me personally, you know, growing up, see the girls versus boys, and as I went from being the tallest in my class to the shortest, seeing boys, my competition surpassing me, that's when I became very aware of gender, but not quite to the same extent as it was once I got on Tumblr, once I got into the 2010s in my, oh, let's see, so I turned 20 in 2012, so yeah, you know, late teens, early 20s. And I would say Tumblr is the main culprit of this antagonistic social justice movement, and this labeling. Um, and even though I was really only there for Super Who Lock, you know, I wanted the supernatural Doctor Who Sherlock stuff, that, that's what I was really there for. When you're amongst this community all the time that chooses to speak in a certain way, say you're a fan of Doctor Who, and you express that fandom through Tumblr, you're going to be met with a very different kind of people, different audience, a different way of speaking than you will on Reddit. The way people talk about Doctor Who on Reddit is not the same as they do on Tumblr. 
probably still is the case today. And so when you are on Tumblr all the time, you are being indoctrinated. You, it's a cult. And that's the thing. Modern day cults, I think we do need to redefine the definition of cult. Because it's not surrounding an individual personality. It is not led by one charismatic leader. It is spread out through through memes. Actually, this is getting into Metal Gear. Um, Cypher's whole plan is the control of information and language. And that is what we're facing now with the way we view sexuality and gender. It is the manipulation and the control of language. There is nothing innate about any of this. Your personal preferences and decisions, that's you. That is up to you. And that is all it is. But now it's a brand, it's an identity, it's a tribe. And that's a really insidious thing. When I was on Tumblr, I became neurotically aware of everyone's gender, race, sexuality all the time to the point that it, I had intrusive thoughts. I had this guilt because I was looking at everyone in terms of privilege and thinking about my privilege or how I had less privilege than someone else or had more privilege than someone. It's insane. You shouldn't think that way. It is obsessive. And that's why people with OCD and ADHD and, and autism are so prevalent in this queer community because it feeds into a lot of those neurotic thought patterns. When I detransitioned, I well, I told my mum about it that oh, I'm going to stop taking testosterone. She, oh, what does this mean? And I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm going to take it slow. I'm going to figure myself out. Oh no, 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 no. She did not let me do that. She took me out shopping. She made me buy all this expensive crap that I never worry. I, I wore this outfit once around her. Never again. I hate all of it. It's been two years. I've, I've tossed it all out now. But yeah, I that wasn't me. It's, it's pretty skanky. I, I don't dress like that. It's this ultra feminine sexualized outfit that she put me in. But I was vulnerable and I didn't know who I was. And I thought, well, if I'm not a man anymore, if I can't take testosterone, then I'm not a man. If I'm not a man, then I can't dress like a man. I have to be a girl, and I have to do girly things. Huh. I'm an adult woman, and an adult woman can be whatever the hell she wants. Back then, you know, I painted my nails, and I obsessively removed every hair from my body, and I wore bras, and although I did have to wear bras, because I was going through the false pregnancy, so the hormones were making me pretty stag, let's just say. Not so much the case anymore. So, now... I wear whatever the hell I want, sometimes it's feminine, sometimes it isn't, and I remove body hair wherever I feel like it, and I don't paint my nails, I do not give a shit, I think that's such a waste of time, I don't wear as much makeup as I used to, I, I'm just not that obsessive about fitting into being as feminine as possible. Now I'm... I wouldn't say I, I'm butch, I wouldn't say I'm femme, I'm just me. Sometimes it looks butch and sometimes it looks femme, doesn't matter. And actually since the accident, the incident as they call it, because it wasn't accidental, that dude probably saw me when he ran me over, but um, since the I was injured, you know, the gender dysphoria returned and I don't feel right being girly. You know, sometimes I, I, I wear those outfits, I went to... Uh, to um, visit my family for Christmas and I was wearing this outfit and being very feminine little princess dress there basically but I yeah it didn't feel like me I feel the most me when I'm wearing military inspired stuff to be honest obstructive stuff suits tailoring that kind of thing. Um, and a friend of mine observed that it seems like I'm basically armoring up with clothes and then I joked yeah I'm in emotional distress quick where are my camo pants it is like that, you know, when I dress like Kazahira or Snake or Ocelot, I feel good, I feel safe, I feel right. And I don't know, it's just sort of channeling the energy of those characters maybe or, or what, but yeah, I, I just like more androgynous stuff, more masculine stuff, if we may put labels on it. And that's just... It's, it's emotional, it's psychological. I'm not going, I've tossed out a few things from my wardrobe, but I'm not going to go through and just get rid of every dress, every girly thing. Um, 
I realized that this is just an emotional thing. It's how I'm expressing myself. I've always expressed myself through wardrobe. So this is not a label. It's not a new identity. It's not a new anything. And that's what I did. I, if, if you've watched my videos for a while, you know that I would go from, oh, well, now I'm this, and now I'm this, and now I'm this, and then I would change again. So I don't think labels work for me at all. I think it's it can be used as a descriptor for what I'm doing in the moment. And I think you could say that about sexuality. You know, am I am a mechanophile? No. I have performed, I have in, participated in mechanophilic behavior. I'm a virgin, if you don't count having sex with cars. So I've never had sex with a woman. So I'm not a lesbian. But when I do, if I do date a woman or have sex with a woman, then I am engaging in sapphic or lesbian behaviors. Because that's all it can be. It is a description of behaviors in the moment. Uh, and that's what, for the longest time, I, uh, the whole definition of bisexual confounded me. You know, pe these, these women who were in committed relationships with men for decades, they have kids, all of that, and they say, oh, I'm bisexual. What does that really mean? It doesn't affect you. You are a married woman in a heterosexual marriage. This label is meaningless. And I didn't know how to articulate it. And I just sort of, you know, nod and politely say, oh, well, you know, you do you, good on you. No, I think sexual labels, it's not a personality. It's not an identity. It doesn't make you different or special. It's merely a descriptor of what you do in the moment. So I would describe it as this. If you are in an open marriage, you're polyamorous, or you're currently dating, you haven't settled down, then you can describe your behaviors as bisexual. You are not a bisexual because a bisexual is not a thing. It is merely a descriptor of your behaviors. So I'm not heterosexual, I'm not homosexual because I've done nothing. I have engaged in mechanophilic behaviors. That is it. And that gets me on to a related point. So years ago, I was reading Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, not to sound pretentious, but I did. And I went down this rabbit hole about biology and, and all that and, and evolution. And what came out time and time again from these experts is that language and categories are a very flawed and limited system and they don't really fulfill their purpose. Because there are so there's okay there's a there's a phenomenon known as panspermia. There are let's say for example there are crabs that just evolve over and over again throughout history on different continents. Evolution keeps making crabs, but they're not related. Uh, this 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 possums in Australia, this possums in America, they have nothing to do with each other. One's a marsupial, the other one isn't. So why do we call them possums? Human language is, is dumb and limited. So when you apply it to evolution, well, who was the first human being? Who were the first humans? Where do you draw the line between human and our closest ancestor, which is there even one ancestor because there were so many hominids, humanoid species, living on Earth at the same time? We do have Neanderthal DNA, especially Europeans. So would we suddenly say, oh, well, because Europeans have more Neanderthal, and that is how you pronounce it, by the way, it's a German word, they have more Neanderthal DNA, are all Europeans now classified as Neanderthal, as a separate species from everyone else? Well, I mean, you could. There's really nothing stopping you. When is someone categorized as a Neanderthal, and when are they categorized as a human? What is the difference? Mostly it is the 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 structure of the brow or the, the proportions and yeah you could say the same thing about race asians have flatter features this was an evolutionary adaptation to the environment africans have darker skin evolutionary adaptation to their environment it's, it's all the same thing what do you draw the line between race and species oh well it's when they can't intermingle with each other humans could breed with are the hominid species, so are they different species or are they different races? People have argued about this for centuries and they always will because 
nature doesn't draw in straight lines. It doesn't put a real firm line in the sand, ever, really. I mean, donkeys and zebras, the donkeys, they can breed, they can make the donkeys. Um, and there are mules. Um, and what was the other, uh, oh, it's a polar bear and the grizzly, pizzly bear, yeah. Are they different species or are they just different races? Is a polar bear just a different race from a grizzly bear? Where do we draw the line? And then when you come to domestic animals, we call them breeds that dogs are bred to have specific features. And well, where do you draw the line between a, a blue healer and a, a, a bull terrier? Or genetically, not much actually. Yes, it, it makes a lot of physical differences, but they all descend from wolves. They all can breed with each other. We can mix whatever breed we want with whatever other breed. Categories. They're just sort of a guidepost, kind of a, like, giving you a vague idea of what we're in for. And that's about it. But, getting back to the whole capitalist thing, I'm thinking about this because it was recently Christmas and buying gifts for people. So we had a secret Santa at work and you didn't get, it was just like a kind of a, a lucky dip. You just, everyone bought a $10 gift, put it in the basket, and then we'll pull it out at random. And I got a candle, actually. Soy candle. I like it. It's good. But I bought a USB because I thought, well, what is the most gender neutral thing I could possibly buy that could be useful to everyone? And I hope whoever got it, you're welcome. <laughs> but the whole capitalist system definitely emphasizes when you're buying gifts, well, here's the gifts for your mother or your father, especially Mother's Day, Father's Day. You're buying for a woman. Here are a, a, a recommended list of things you buy for a woman, or you could buy these things for a man. I think a lot of things you would buy for a man would actually be more appropriate to me. Power tools, video game stuff, that would be more relevant to me than anything you would typically buy for a woman. I don't use a lot of candles, actually. I don't use a lot of makeup. I don't wear heels often, if at all, uh, especially not since I broke my leg, or my leg was broken by force. But yeah, when you put people into these categories, and so say I was looking at this email I saw that said, oh, gifts for men, gifts for women, whatever, you know, however it was, his and her gifts. I can't remember what it says physically. But I was looking at it going, well, this stuff for him is more relevant to my particular hobbies and interests and needs. So then subconsciously, these things fill you with this idea of, oh, well, I guess I must be different. I guess I'm not like other girls. I must be special. I must be better. I must be worse. I must be... Whatever it is, you are just not normal. You're not conforming to these arbitrary standards. The other thing I need to get into in another video is the cult of autism. Autism has gone from just being a diagnosis to being a social justice movement, a minority that needs to have the same rights as everyone else, and that there's nothing wrong with them, that they are just a different kind of people. And that's totally wrong. I always saw autism, rightly, as a disability. It's not a social construct, not a social disability. That is something we can observe in the brain that causes sensory and social issues. And I was very anxious at all times about all things sensory. I was just, yeah, it, it, I'm not that way at all. I am much more relaxed, much more comfortable. I don't have any of those issues. Although, scary to note, I was looking at the results of my MRI and the part of my brain that was injured, but not injured too severely, had it been damaged further, would have caused an inability to read facial expressions or to focus on one voice in a crowd rather than hearing everything. So I would have been right back at square one. I would have been just out of the blue, hit by a car, and then had autism symptoms again. Great. So this is something we can observe in the brain. It is a deviation. It is a disability. It is not... It. I mean, the, the savant abilities could be seen as advantageous, but at the risk or at the consequence of that individual, that patient not living as fully as they could, as independently, as comfortably as they could, 
I, I don't get... I never did when I was autistic. I didn't understand the autism pride. I mean, I definitely thought, yeah, look, I have this condition that I will have for the rest of my life. Thankfully, no. Um, and I will just accept it and society needs to accept that this cannot be changed. But that takes away all the responsibility of that autistic individual. You get to this point now, and the same thing with ADHD as well, that people with these conditions act like, well, society, neurotypicals need to accept us the way we are. No, you, you can learn. It's not impossible. You can learn to adapt and have certain compensatory skills so that you can integrate society normally. And this is where the whole individualism versus collectivism thing is just running rapid. It's just out of control. That people with milder disabilities refuse to learn how to integrate. But I was never like that. I wanted to fit in with society because we're social animals. Standing against society just to be belligerent and difficult doesn't help you. And uh, Exa Lancic, who is sometimes on YouTube, if you're aware of, she did a video ages ago where she spoke about the same thing, that she does have autism. And she said, well, you can learn. I learned, I've learned a lot of skills that allow me to integrate in society, to function better in society. What purpose does it serve to draw this line to to force yourself apart from society not to try to integrate but well, we are the autistic tribe fuck everyone else we're autistic and we don't have to do anything that anyone else is expects of no that is a really terrible attitude to have and yeah yeah when i uh, i did another video on this ages ago but my problem was actually my, my autism was caused by inflammation of the brain caused by food intolerances. So once I went carnival, all those problems went away. And so I was excommunicated from the Church of Autism. You know, I was viciously abandoned by friends. I people who I thought were my friends, but they really were only using me as a political tool for their own agenda. And it's because they so rigidly saw autism as it is a lifelong thing. Well, actually, I've spoken to autism researchers and therapists, and they say, we just don't know. There's very little we know definitively about this condition. And we have seen people improve this condition through diet. You see these articles all the time that uh, you know, parents notice their child developing autism symptoms, and then they cut out dairy or gluten. It's funny enough, dairy is good for me, but yeah, dairy and gluten seem to be the main triggers. And then their child continues to develop neurotypically. And oh, the autism community hates that. That's not real autism. This is a scam. This is a lie. Again, when you define things by these rigid definitions that have no real basis in reality, it's a cult. It's a religion. It's a philosophy with no real tangible application to real life. So to conclude, and I can't believe I've actually gone through this in less than an hour, the only labels I would apply to myself are woman. I'm definitely a woman. You look at my body. Naturally, I, I have all the features of a biological woman, my chromosomes, my gametes. It's not up for debate. There's no way I could be described as anything else. It is a scientific fact. And I would describe myself as Australian because, well, unless Australia doesn't actually exist, it is just a conspiracy. I'm just a paid actor. This is, I'm actually in the United States right now. Or maybe if I drive far enough east, go past Sydney, maybe I will actually just come all the way around. I'll just find myself in America. I don't know. It's all one. We're actually Pangaea. It's one continent. How do you know for sure that we have all these separate continents? Um, but yeah. I know for a fact, based on satellite imagery, that I am in fact an Australian living in Australia and I have never lived anywhere else and government records will show that I am an Australian citizen and have always been here in this country. So that is undeniable fact, it's not up for debate, it's not philosophy, it's not perspective. Geographically, this is where I am and always have been and always will be probably. But what does it mean to be Australian? What does it mean to be a woman? Nothing. 
it's a collection of stereotypes. I actually, I don't think I am a, a, a stereotype or, or particularly typical, an example of either one of those things. Um, yeah, everything, er, what I'm trying to think of all the, the stereotypical things people associate with Australia. And yeah, I do some of those things, but not all of them. So I think from now on, I'm opening up myself to way more possibilities. I've changed so much in the past few years. I've gone from one label to another, trying on different ones, seeing what fits, what works, what feels right for me. But I'm constantly changing. And actually, this is a, it's a quote, I think, from a Neil Gaiman book, but I haven't been able to track it down. You will always be you, but who you are is always changing. I used to think people didn't believe in labels or idiots, you know, uh, a very effeminate gay man that I went to uni with, he said, oh, I don't believe in labels. I'm whatever I am in the moment. And so, you know, he said something like that. So, you are so obviously gay. You are the gayest man I have ever seen. And then I just go, no. Well, why did I have to so rigidly categorize anyone? I think they limit us. They don't define us. They only define what we do in the moment. So now... I'm going to be like water. And until next time, see you, Space Cowboy.